my name is Jackie Wyrock, and we are back again with another episode of You and Your Health. And today my guest is Lisa Schirmerhorn. Lisa, welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming to Orca Media. Um, I see you've just opened an office not too far from here over on School Street. Yes. And this is where you practice hypnotherapy. Yes. Oh. Uh, Portals. It's at Portals Center for Healing. And uh, I'm there uh, part time, and then I'm also in uh, Waitsfield. I have an office there as well. So tell me how you got involved with doing hypnotherapy. Um, I went through a very difficult time a number of years ago, and I was struggling, and I was going to conventional therapists a couple times a week, and I wasn't getting better. And someone had recommended going to a hypnotherapist, and I found myself feeling better. And I was really amazed at how much better I was feeling. And um, this woman that I met was a hypnotherapist. She was a Reiki master, and she did all kinds of really cool stuff. So I decided that I'm just going to learn everything that she does, because <laughs> I wanted to be like her. And after I did that, I realized I couldn't be like her. <laughs> I had to figure out <laughs> what I wanted to do. <laughs> well, what's a Reiki master? Um, Reiki is an energy that actually you channel, it comes through you and comes out your hands and it's this he beautiful healing modality that's a hands-on healing that helps the body heal itself. Wow, so how long does it take for one to become a Reiki master? Um, there's different levels, so you do your Reiki 1 and then there's uh, Reiki 2 which is distance Reiki um, and then I became a Reiki master. Actually I studied with William Lee Rand in, um, in Glastonbury, England. Wow. And then we uh, did what's called our attunement so that we could have the ability uh, what they put these, these Japanese symbols into our chakras for people who are energy centers and we did that at Stonehenge. Wow, yeah, that how was really cool. cool. Yeah, it was really cool. So you mentioned distance. Yes. So tell me about that. So with uh, distance Reiki, there's actually symbols that you learn and you focus on the person you want to heal and you send healing to, to someone um, that they can just be laying down on the couch at home, hanging out. And are they aware that this is happening? You like to tell them in advance. <laughs> Have they invited you in and yes, scheduled yes, this ahead yes. of time? Okay, <laughs> that's great. Now, the hypnotherapy, mm -hmm. I seem to recall hearing that it was also very much tied into shamanism. Well, there, I actually do integrate some shamanic things into my hypnosis. Um, so hypnotherapy is working with the subconscious mind. Okay. So from birth until you're about 19 years old, your brain frequency is different than it is as an adult. So as a, as a newborn, it's in delta, which is a really deep, long wave. If you think about all the things that babies and toddlers have to learn and absorb around sound and shadow and languaging, um, emotion, so we're being programmed through those brain frequencies and we're absorbing at a very deep level. So as we go through our childhood, that wave speeds up and by the time we get to high school we're in what's called uh, alpha which is that daydreamy state okay and then once we hit about 19 everything that you've experienced as a child gets programmed very deep it's very deep so everything you know about money everything that you know about love and relationship any trauma if you've been bullied any accidents anything that's occurred uh, any belief systems so your religion all of those things, that's why as adults, it gets locked in. And then we go to beta, which is what we're at now, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then we go through our life and then we have this undercurrent of these belief systems that, that you know, we, we struggle with. And these, these, these belief systems that run us as adults and we have trouble accessing it. Because when you're in talk therapy, you're actually talking to someone at beta. You're not generally accessing where the information is. So all hypnotherapy is, is going into this state between being asleep and awake. And you're in that state seven to 10 times a day, naturally. 
and I can't make anyone do anything they don't, they don't want to do. People are always like, are you going to make me quack like a duck? That's a different form of hypnosis that I'm not trained in. I don't even know how to make people do that. But the stage hypnotists tend to scare people. Okay. I don't do anything like that. If someone comes to me for smoking cessation or weight loss, they have to want to do it and they have to partner with me in it. Uh, I'm helping them eliminate the belief systems around it or why. For instance, with smoking cessation, I had a client who came in at 12 years old, his father died. His uncle brought him to the funeral and to make him feel better, 40 years ago, he said, offered his nephew a cigarette to help him feel better. Well, that cigarette, what it did was it numbed him and never allowed him to fully feel his grief over the loss of his father, mm. and he continued to smoke. So when we did the work, we went back to the origin of where that smoking came from, and we released it, and he no longer had the desire. So hypnosis can be a very powerful tool to unearth these, these belief systems that are running us, because especially with food, food can be love, food is a comfort, mm -hmm. and so, and it's the, the most difficult addiction, in my opinion, well, other than heroin, because that's actually rewiring the ba brain, but when you have something like food addiction, you have to eat every day. Mm -hmm. It's not like someone who's drinking and you, they have to change their life and not just be around alcohol they have to really get to the root cause of why they're eating. Otherwise, um, they'll find another addiction or it, it doesn't work. They just keep, they keep eating. They eat through like the gastric band mm -hmm. surgery. They'll eat through it and actually their, you know, um, esophagus will expand if they wow. don't do their work. There was a study done by um, University of Pennsylvania uh, Medical School on the gastric band, the um, it's not the gastric band, it's the um, the other surgery, I, it escapes me, but um, what they found was the people who went through the surgery and didn't deal with their issue went on to become alcoholics or drug addicts. Yeah, I've actually, um, I, I'm in recovery. Yeah. Um, I've been recovered from um, drug and alcohol for almost 16 years now, and what I've been hearing a lot about recently is people who have this surgery that the alcohol um, is going directly to their brain and they're becoming alcoholics like that. Yeah. And it's kind of frightening that doctors aren't aware to inform their patients that this is something that's l likely to happen. Um, a lot of the new people that have um, shown up in 12-step recovery have talked about they don't even get to enjoy um, the alcohol as it's coursing through their body. They go immediately into blackout. Wow. So doctors aren't aware of that and I think that needs to be communicated. Yeah. I had no idea. So I wonder if that's the ga there's the gastric band and then there's the other surgery where they remove part of the stomach. That I wonder if that that might be it. I don't know. Yeah. I've I've there's heard it from surgeries. a number of people yeah. though, and I've never oh. gone in to question them. Um, another thing uh, I think is interesting when I um, first got into recovery, um, I was involved with a group that. Um, uh, Overeaters Anonymous, the, the woman who started that, mm -hmm. she would come to that same group yeah. and um, mm -hmm. I, I never heard her talking about whether it was getting underneath those, those mm -hmm. uh, embedded ideas that right. occurred at, at such an early age. Well, a lot of times it's unconscious. Right. For most people it's unconscious. Right. And so they don't even know why they're eating and they're just feeling it's, it's a compulsion. And oftentimes, people who have eating addiction, they're eating at night. Mm. They're bored. Mm -hmm. You know, during the day, they can generally eat very, and what they'll do is they'll eat very little, mm -hmm. and then at night, they'll binge eat. Right. When they start to deal with their emotion when they come down from the day. Um, so it's it's a fascinating, you know, journey to watch someone. Uh, and, and, 
you know, where, where those beliefs come from, what happened in their life. Right. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to ask you, you were talking about the ages of from uh, birth through 19. Mm -hmm. um, what about pre-birth? Yeah. I've actually hypnotized people into the womb because you can actually feel what your mother is experiencing. You take that on energetically. So I've had people where if their mother was frightened or didn't want to have them or if they were going through whatever trauma they, they were having. So um, I mentioned chakras. Mm -hmm. So chakras are, we have seven energy centers and the first one to form is at the base of the spine and that's all about the fundamentals of what we need as a baby, the nurturing, love, being cared for, um, and our physical body. So as that's being formed, those are being, that, the, that belief system is being planted in at an emotional level into the first chakra. So you come in feeling unwanted. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I've actually brought people back to the womb and done some healing where we balance the heartbeats together and have compassion for the mother and have a better understanding of what they were experiencing and release any of those fears. I bring this up from personal experience. Yeah. My, um, my mother was told that her husband, my father, was killed in a car accident while I was in the womb wow. at five months and um, she didn't even know she was pregnant. Wow. Um, so she went through a lot of trauma and I've always believed that that had to have been passed along to me. Absolutely. You take on the grief. As a matter of fact, I have a friend of mine who went through the same thing. Her oh, mother yeah? was pregnant when, uh, and she's had tremendous amount of grief issues throughout her life. And she could never understand why it was so embedded yeah. in her. Yeah. 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 Something to work on. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Another layer. <laughs> Yeah, we say peeling the onion. Yeah, I'm it just is. Just talking about that. <laughs> it is. So the hypnotherapy is mm -hmm. the one area that is that your prime focus. Well, you did mention. So I do. I, I've studied uh, different forms of shamanism over the past 18 years, and one of the things that I do is in shamanism they do something called a journey and they do soul retrieval. Mm -hmm. So they believe that parts of you, when you go through a traumatic experience, parts of your soul leave. And a shaman will lay shoulder to shoulder, hip to hip on the floor, and someone will drum or rattle, and that creates this uh, trance state. And then the shaman will go to what's called the lower world. There's upper world where spirit beings are, the middle world where we are, and the lower world where they believe the um, animal totems, power animals, um, it's not, they don't believe in heaven and hell, and where the soul parts have gone. Ah. So a shaman will go and retrieve those parts and breathe them back into your chakras, into your heart and your crown chakra. What I do is I actually hypnotize someone and have them go on their own journey and experience bringing those parts back. Themselves. How do they know which parts are theirs? Well, this is the thing. It's usually a younger version of yourself. So a one-year-old, your five-month-old could be, you, actually your five-month gestational part mm. of you could be there. Wow. And so if you think about if you were a thousand-piece puzzle and 20 pieces were missing, you're not whole. Right. So the whole concept of it is bringing back those pieces. And when those pieces are ready and when those pieces feel that it's safe to return. Now they don't always come back. So this is an opportunity to, for you to journey down and retrieve that three-year-old and hold that part and bring it back and integrate it. Or sometimes it's shown up as physical body parts like the heart, eyes, um, legs. I actually had uh, one one person actually, you know, was literally energetically putting their legs back on, put back their heart, and then they said, "I'm guided. There's this water I need to wash my eyes with. It's this holy water." So he went over and washed his eyes. When he came out, um, when he came back, I was staring at his eyes, and he's like, "What's wrong?" I said, "Your eyes, your eye colors changed." He said, "What?" He said, I've never been able to see my eyes. I never knew what color they were. 
and he went over and looked in the mirror before they were like a gray blue and then they had turned like this aqua blue wow and he said i can see my eyes now chills i know isn't wow. that cool wow so everyone's experience is different and i mean i can't even those are just two of of hundreds of different scenarios that happen everyone's different but everyone has a profound you know uh, experience with it and also with the hypnosis i do past life regressions i do life between lives work yeah i was reading about that yeah. tell me about that so the life between lives work is actually where you have a past life regression then you come back a week later and you do two past life regressions in a row because what you're doing is establishing like your soul has a thumbprint and there's a personality there's there's a there's a uniqueness that's just you so you're getting to see a, a thread and then from there at the end of the last past life regression you're at the death scene and the soul leaves the body and instead of coming back we ask it to go to the heavens consciousness to experience what it was like to be in the heavens realm so you always come up there's always a gate and then there's a your um, spirit guide is generally there and the spirit guides will come and take you and you get to meet your soul group which is the group that you incarnate with every life or in different lifetimes with so this is my belief is that each lifetime is like a movie and we just play different roles in the movie and that we pre we decide before we come in what lessons are here for our soul and there's a council that oversees you and your decision of how you want to incarnate in this life and then the different people in your soul group choose to um, behave a certain way so that that healing will occur so when you think about a soulmate a soulmate isn't that pitter patter I love you right this the soulmate can come in as someone to do some really dark you know painful things to you so that your soul can overcome that adversity for your soul's growth so it's very different between a soulmate and then a twin flame which is you know someone who comes in that's that's the, the love that true love that that bond that you have but a soulmate you know so so it helped me become grateful for the people who harmed me in any way or that I gave my power away to because it made me who I am and it's part of my soul's growth so it shifted the way I started to see the world and see my life and is this when the divorce happened well the divorce is a year ago okay so this has been going the other work that I've done was from some childhood okay um, but the divorce um, has ha happened a year ago New Year's Day um, my husband of 30 years asked me for a divorce and our, our marriage had been coming undone for a long time so it wasn't that it wasn't expected but um, it took me this past year of just learning to be on my own. My, both my children had just graduated from high school. And I'm in high school, college. They both graduated UNH. And suddenly I was an empty nester and I was, you know, on my own. And I'd never been by myself. I, I met my, um, I call him my husband, my soon-to-be ex, because he's not my ex yet. <laughs> I never knew what to call him. So my husband. <laughs> You know, you know, we're we're slowly work, working through things, but you know, I look at him as my gift. You know, I met him when I was 19 years old, mm. and so he was the perfect person for me when I was 19, and he was 21. Right. And our our contract, our soul contract, was up, and uh, it's time for both of us to just have different lives. Interesting. Yeah. I have one of those. I call him my practice husband. <laughs> learned everything not to do in a relationship. Well, 30 years is a long time for me to be practicing. <laughs> Doctors practice medicine every yeah, day. That's true. <laughs> and actually, that's why I wanted to do this show is because um, our medical system has become so much about um, immediate gratification right. and is highly influencing our subconscious with 
television advertising about pharmaceutical drugs and um, my uh, personal experience of uh, going to doctors and various ailments and rather than looking at holistically what's going right. on with this person, body, mind, and spirit, um, take a pill. And it doesn't really seem effective. No, and it's fascinating because um, when you mentioned before about the body-mind connection, one of the things that I study, there's a woman, Louise Hay, oh, with sure. Hay House, and she talks about a lot of that. Sure. Um, and there's another book that I use, there's a lot of books on this, where they talk about when you've experienced um, something that's happened in your life, it can manifest in your body. And so when you suppress an emotion and you don't deal with it, it will happen. Oftentimes people who have lower back issues, that's either um, feeling unsupported or financial issues. Shoulders, those are people who feel the weight of the world. Um, oftentimes there's a lot of metaphor around it. Uh, neck, if your neck hurts, who's being a pain in the neck? <laughs> you know, it really does work. Or knees, fear of moving forward, joint issues. Arthritis can be someone who's very rigid in their life. So what I do is I work with people on when someone will fill out a form, I'll ask them about their physical issues because that's often to me because I do a lot of detective work on where, finding the root cause and I will look up in my books and find out what are some of the emotional issues around that particular part of the body. High blood pressure is like a volcano ready to erupt. What about it's low suppressed blood pressure? In, um, you know what, I have really low blood pressure and um, it, I'm trying to remember what that one was about. Um, something about having difficulty in life, like energy, low energy or in life. Um, I have to look that up for you. Um, it's been a while since I looked at that one. I went to one of my best friends, um, died. Uh, she was my best friend from high school and I was asked to do uh, um, uh, speak at her funeral and I found out a lot of things that were going on that she hid from everyone and on my way home on the plane my my eyes were bright bright red they, and to the point where the fellow next to me was like do you know that your eye your right eye is really really red and I looked it up and it's what is it that you don't want to see what is it you don't want to know and so it took me three days. I didn't go to the doctor. I just released the emotions around the pain, and then the redness went away. Wow. And that's not to say that everything is emotionally related, but there are a lot of, a lot of things that go on in our bodies that we often create and suppress. I think it's fascinating to me that there are um, cycles for different um, illnesses that will pop up in the body. Like I remember when I was growing up, um, a big thing that you heard about was ulcers. Uh. And we don't hear much about ulcers today, but we hear about uh, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia, yes. Fibromyalgia, I find, is people losing will to live. Ah. Like they're, they're, it's not, it, it's the loss of purpose. Mm. They don't have a purpose. And that's not to say everyone does that, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, we get so wrapped up and programmed and live our lives through other people. We have these, you know, people have certain expectations. Oh, you should take this job because you'll get paid more. And people listen, and I always call them the dream killers. So when someone, when people over and over again talk you into doing things that really aren't things that you want to do, because if you listen to your heart and you do what you're here to do, most of the time it doesn't make sense and people think you're crazy. How many times do you go, I can't believe they're doing that? And they'll try it because they think they're saving you. Right. Yeah, I had that with my mom the first time I left a, uh, a high paying, uh, safe job that right. had insurance to go work in the music industry. Why would you give that up? Yeah. I'm like, um, well, it, it, that whole safety thing, it's an illusion. <laughs> it, it absolutely is. 
And, uh, you know, people looked at me. I lived in New Hampshire for eight years. I had a support system there. And here I went to Vermont not knowing anyone, living by myself. And people were like, why would you do that? You know, look at, you know, you're 54 years old. Why would you be doing that? I said, I'm just called to do it. I can't explain it. I'm just supposed to be there and I don't know why. And I live my life a lot by that, is just I, when I feel, you know, called to that. And uh, a lot of people have trouble with that. <laughs> I don't understand. It's their problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you oh. so much. The time has gone oh, by wow. so quickly, but um, we'll have you back again to continue yeah. the conversation. So I have some workshops and some events coming up. So oh, you do? Yeah. Well, we'll make sure we add that to the end of the program so yeah. people can uh, look you up, find out about the workshops, and reach out to find out more about the many offerings that you have in helping people to um, become more well with uh, all of the tools that are available outside of just your normal medical community, um, pharmaceuticals, there's a, a plethora of options and Lisa has many gifts to share with you so um, at the end of this program and uh, throughout the show we'll make sure that that is popping up on the screen so that they can contact you. Terrific. So thank you again very much and until next time, namaste. namaste.